Let's now move to item number 10, page 217, proposed city planning commission certification concerning the subdivision of a zoning lot within the special South Richmond Development District. Item number 10, page 217, Outer Ridge Commons subdivision. And I'd like to introduce Catherine Conte, who's making her first presentation before the commission as well. Good afternoon. Uh, just give me a minute. So good afternoon, commissioners. This presentation is for a private application for a city planning, um, the city planning commission certification for future zoning lot subdivision in the special South Richmond development district uh, in order to subdivide one 12.5 acre zoning lot uh, with two separate own, separately owned tax lots into two zoning lots. The applicants seek this subdivision so that they may proceed as separate zoning lots when they plan to individually return um, for additional zoning actions in the future to facilitate their two unrelated commercial development proposals. The project is located in the southwest portion of Staten Island's Community District 3 in the Richmond Valley neighborhood. The subject site is just south of the on-ramp of the um, Outer Bridge Crossing, which is here, going into New Jersey. The area is served by Bus Route 78 along Arthur Kill Road to the west of the subject site here. And the Staten Island Railroad um, with nearby Arthur Kill and Richmond Valley stations, which is located here to the south of the site. The area is characterized by primarily commercial development, light industrial uses, and low density residential communities. Two New York City Department of Parks and Recreation managed properties are near the subject site. That would be Long Pond Park to the south, down here, and Fairview Park to the north, up here. This area has seen many new residential and commercial development projects in the past 10 years, many of which have come through the City Planning Commission for Special South Richmond Development District actions and approvals. An example is the Charleston Mixed Use Development Project located to the north of the subject site in this area here, um, which, was, uh, which involved the ED, an EDC-sponsored development of city-owned land and included the development of the DPR managed uh, Fairview Park as noted above. The area east of this site is characterized by commercial strip malls along Page Avenue and low density residential areas beyond. The area south of the site includes in former industrial areas along Richmond Valley Road that have been recently redeveloped uh, for commercial uses. Mill Creek, which is down here, and its associated public and privately owned wetlands are located just beyond, less than a quarter mile south of the subject zoning lot. The area to the west of the site is defined by Arthur Kill, which is right here, and the associated wetlands that drain into it. The subject site is one of a number of large undeveloped parcels in this area, most of which contain privately owned mapped wetland areas. The subject site is, a, as set, stated, a 12.5 acre zoning lot with two tax lots. It's located in an M11 district, which typically serves as a buffer between more intensive manufacturing districts, such as the M31 district to the south, and nearby residential and commercial districts, such as the R3X district to the east. The subject zoning lot is a through lot with approximately 775 feet of frontage on Page Avenue and 161 feet of frontage on Richmond Valley Road, which is located along here. It contains the bed of four unbuilt map streets. Army Corps of Engineer wetland jurisdictional areas are located on the site in light blue, and DEC wetland jurisdictional areas are located in light green, um, are also present. These jurisdictional areas trigger further review. Um, in this case, uh, there was a wetland delineation by um, New York State DEC, uh, which is shown here in the dark blue. 
Um, and so, and that was the most recent delineation was in 2016. The shape of the present zoning lot was created in 2007 uh, through a subdivision and reapportionment action approved by the City Planning Commission and associated with uh, South Richmond authorizations for accessory parking lot and curb cuts to facilitate one-story commercial development down here um, on the formed lots one, three, five, and seven uh, during that action along Page Avenue. So. At the time, uh, according to public tax and property records, in 2007, the owners of the zoning lot obtained a tax lot subdivision along what was then the boundary of the 100-foot wetland adjacent area. Um, and this is what created uh, current tax lot 80. Uh, according to the most recent wetland delineation of the site shown in dark blue, the DC regulated wetland area has since um, uh, encroached onto lot, um, tax lot 80. So. Both sites are subject to DEC review. The adjacent site to the west, this is a large 11-acre um, privately owned vacant site. Um, and it also uh, contains a small area of storage use. Uh, this lot includes DEC and Army Corps of Engineer um, jurisdictional wetland areas that are contiguous with the wetlands located on the subject site. Um, together, these subject properties are part of what is um, recognized as a recognized ecological complex known as Outer Bridge Ponds and Woodlands that has been identified in a number of reports, including our Working West Shore 2030 report, Island Nature by the Trust for Public Land, and the Audubon Society, and the Hudson Raritan Estuary Comprehensive Restoration Plan. Um, according to these reports, this area is deserving of ecosystem restoration and preservation of habitat connections. The 12.5 acre zoning lot remains undeveloped at present with a wooded character. The topography of the existing zoning lot is generally flat. The dark blue highlights the DEC flagged wetland on the zoning lot with the light blue highlighting the 100 foot adjacent area. The lightest blue represents the outer 40 feet of the adjacent area within which DEC has given lot 17 preliminary approval to allow the proposed development to encroach upon this area. In addition to the DC regulated wetlands, tax lot 80 contains less than an acre of wetlands under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps of Engineers and about 0.25 acres of isolated non-jurisdictional wetlands. Lot 80 has already received a, nation, a nationwide permit for, from the Army Corps of Engineers for their proposed disturbance of these wetland areas, including a mitigation plan. The proposed zoning lot subdivision would follow the existing tax lot subdivision. Since the site is in an M11 manufacturing district, there are no underlying zoning lot width or area requirements for the future zoning lots. Proposed zoning lot 17 would be 5.7 acres and would be a through lot with um, 161 feet of frontage along Richmond Valley, Richmond Valley Road, a final map street of 100 foot width and 324 feet of frontage along Page Avenue, a final map street of 80 foot width. Proposed zoning lot 80 would be an interior lot of 6.8 acres with 450, approximately 450 feet of frontage on Page Avenue. Page Avenue is also mapped as an arterial street within the Special South Richmond um, Development District. There is a 42-inch storm sewer fronting um, both tax lot 17 and 80 on Page Avenue. There is a 12-inch sanitary sewer fronting tax lot 17 on Richmond Valley Road and a 10-inch sanitary sewer fronting tax lot 80 on Page Avenue. The proposed subdivision will not preclude any future environmental review and will require each site to account for the proposed development on the, proposed, on the other proposed zoning lot. So just as a, a review, these... This request for a certification of future subdivision requires that the commission certify that the subdivision plan complies with the approved South Richmond plan, where the goals of the special South Richmond development district are summarized here. Due to the large size of this lot, it's over five acres, the area, an area plan is included as a required part of the subdivision certification, where the area plan will demonstrate the proposed lot layouts areas of no disturbance, and vehicular circulation, parking, and curb cuts associated with the proposed development scenarios. 
Here's the area plan. The proposed development scenario for both lots would require future City Planning Commission actions for which the applicants plan to apply at a later time separately. The area plan for proposed lot 17 includes a combined retail office and warehouse facility with accessory parking spaces. The applicant team proposes a multi-level underground parking lot. Um, this is this building here. Um, which is going to be incorporated into the building with a small area of surface parking in the back. The preliminary development scenario for proposed lot 17 incorporates outdoor seating areas facing the wetland, a walking path along the wetland boundary, and an overlook area with a pedestrian ramp connection to a crosswalk on the adjacent proposed lot 80. The future development scenario proposed for lot 17 also includes a proposal for native planting in the wetland area that will connect to the proposed mitigation area for proposed lot 80. So it's this area here. The area plan for proposed lot 80 includes one and two story commercial buildings with retail uses as well as a surface parking lot. The applicant team for lot 80 is proposing an area of no disturbance, which is this area here. Um, for wetland mitigation on the quote unquote tail portion of tax lot 80. This will provide a continuous area of wetland preservation between the wetlands on tax lot 17 and the wetlands located on the adjacent undeveloped 11 acre private property to the, north, um, to the west of the site. And therefore, um, that's also in recognition of the, um, the pre habitat preservation and continuity um, called out in the uh, recognized ecological complex reports. So in summary, this certification will facilitate the subdivision of one zoning lot into two zoning lots that will be developed separately by their respective owners after pursuing additional required zoning actions at the Department of City Planning for their individual commercial development projects. The area plan will be binding in terms of proposed areas of no disturbance, zoning lot layouts, and the vehicular circulation as described associated with the proposed development scenarios. Thank you. And I would just note that it was the applicant's choice to proceed in this two-step um, fashion to proceed separately. Yes, Commissioner mm -hmm. Ephraim. It's a, perhaps a broad question, but mm -hmm. it has narrow application. Um, if the maps change, uh, the wetland maps change, according to DEC, mm -hmm. um, what happens if the next wetland map shows it entirely covering the building on lot um, 17? Sure. Um, I'll just I'll start, and Nicole, my deputy director, will assist. Um, so this is the most recent delineation. Um, they're going to need DEC permits for their development. So um, the DEC has already seen this proposal, and they've given um, preliminary sign-off on it. But they won't. They'll be. They're waiting to you know until the applicant comes and formally um, applies for the permit. And, um, so DEC mapped wetlands are on a map that was created in, in 1988 and has not been updated since 1988. So it's not that the map would change, um, although it could change, but that would require a long process that ultimately we would hear about. Um, so the map would not change, but DEC may determine they want to revisit the site at a later point and do another survey and flag the wetlands anew. But that would be up to DEC um, to determine. And, and typically, with these applications that are coming before the commission that also require DEC permits, we encourage the applicants to um, pursue those approvals with the agencies kind of in parallel mm -hmm. so that um, the agencies can work out any potential conflicting information um, or guidance as, as necessary. Okay, so it's not as if next year they're going to remap this and it'll be... It is highly unlikely the DEC maps will change next year. And this is from 2016 and it's the very recent delineation. 
the delineation is from 2016 as opposed to the map, which hasn't changed since 1988. Yes, Commissioner Besser. Thank you. Is a preliminary sign-off the same as a conditional approval? No. Um, we, we don't have anything in, in writing, per se, from DEC, but our agencies coordinate on a monthly basis, um, given the number of applications that overlap between our two agencies. Um, so we have enough of a preliminary sign-off um, that we felt comfortable bringing this application before you, but it is, it's not the same as a conditional sign-off. Could we? But that, that level of review and sign-off would um, proceed more formally as the, the two separate um, developers move forward with their actual development mm -hmm. proposals. Could we obtain a conditional sign-off? Uh, we can ask. Um, I don't think that the applicants have reached that level of, of review with DEC, but we can look into it to see if maybe they've proceeded further in the past few weeks. Thank you. Commissioner so, so just to, um, to clarify and perhaps provide the level, maybe the, the level of comfort in this, and, and this, is, I guess I could see the distinction between this one and the one earlier since this is really just a subdivision although it has an area plan because of the size of the the um the the lot, lot, the, the, uh, that in the event dc did not provide approval or at any point the development of either or both of these mm -hmm. let's assume subdivided lots would occur they'd have to come back to us and certainly we couldn't approve the, a development plan if these if, if in some way it affected the wetlands that were designated in DC right I mean sign off on it. We've, right. we've worked with council to get an understanding of the level to which this approval or certification rather of the area plan is binding and since the Commission is considering areas of no disturbance the zoning lot subdivision boundaries and the um, vehicular circulation if any of those things change Changed then it would render the, the subdivision moot, so to speak, and they would have to come back. They could, they could not come in here separately with a development proposal that is drastically different mm -hmm. from this, especially within those three categories, and expect to move forward as, it, as their own zoning lot. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to revisit this subdivision certification or adjust their development proposal to better match this. And, and I'm assuming then, too, that at least I guess both prop. I, I don't see much wetlands on lot 80, but I'm assuming there's got to be some wetlands on lot. So this is the. Oh, I see how lot. The DC. So the DC wetland just kind of gets into uh, lot, 80, lot 80, and then the adjacent yeah. area goes into lot 80. Um, so that's the. This is the main area of DC jurisdiction on lot 80 is up here. Got it. Got it. There, so I, I guess I was just. There mm -hmm. are Army Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, wetland. There are wetlands on lot 80 that are under the Army Corps okay. jurisdiction, yeah. um, which they have preliminary sign off from as okay. well. Um, I think they, they those are completed. better shown on another slide. So, um, and that's you know further information that we could get to you so as we, well. They actually completed a a, a permit, a, a national, a nationwide permit with Army Corps, um, but that permit is since because of the encroachment of DC, they do need to now kind of get it some additional review for that permit to be um, finalized. Okay, okay, and then I guess the area plan that we, we saw <coughs> at least on lot 17, it was created with the expectation that DEC would sign off Yes. Are prepared to, to absent something else happening would sign off on on this with its proximity yes. to the buffer and all of that. The, the delineation from roughly 2007 led the original owner of this property to believe that this tax lot subdivision would render one <coughs> this one tax lot free of mm -hmm. wetlands and one without. And per the new um, delineation, after you know. Yeah. It, that, that's not the case any longer. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Besser? Thank you. I just thought um, it would be good if we could have a copy of that permit. 
the the DEC, the DEC, the nationwide permit. Okay. We, we, can, we can that show you a copy of that. We, we would just need you all to understand that that is not final in the sense that it would have to be revised mm -hmm. um, given the new information about the DEC wetland. Right. Okay. So they're, they're both, nothing's been finalized yet in terms of the permits, but those the conversations have been going on. But we can, we can work with maybe the applicant team to prepare a memo to describe um, the, the level to which they've engaged in conversations with both of these agencies um, and get confirmation from DEC. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Well, that may preview the answer to my question. Long and complicated process. I noticed that this application was filed two and a half years ago uh, with DCP, mm -hmm. December um, of 2014. Yes. yes. Why has it taken them so long to get to this point? So it. Is this a good public process at work? This is a single zoning lot um, that currently has two different owners because the tax lot subdivision was done, you know, separate from this agency mm -hmm. through the Department of Finance. So the original single owner of this zoning lot elected to sell off um, half roughly, of the site in the form of a separate tax lot. Um, and then the two owners wanted to proceed as two separate development proposals um, immediately, but they were still joined as a zoning lot. And because this is not, so to speak, a typical zoning lot subdivision in the sense that all we're looking at is a, a line, um, it did require the area plan. And so it took a while to um, get an area plan together that I think both sides could be comfortable with and that um, you know, showed a level of uh, feasible development. Yeah, a feasible development scenario and also respected um, the wetland area. So there were some preliminary conversations that had to be had with DEC before they could really put together an area plan that, that was, relatively speaking, feasible. So there's some preliminary review that was done internally within this agency about the degree to which um, the parking would work on the site, the floor area. Um, there are future CPC actions that would be required for both sides, um, for both sites. So, but all of that detail is to be, you know, reviewed further when they come back. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of proceeding at their own risk, to, to in a sense. It does seem like a process nightmare, but. This actually seems like it could be a planning or real estate development school issue spotter on an exam. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, this item now will get referred to the community board for 45 days. All right, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's now move to item number 13. The East River 50 second place text amendment, which involves proposed modifications to existing zoning regulations regulations within portions of Community District 6 and to create a new voluntary inclusionary housing designated area. Our presenter is Bob Tuttle, the lead project manager in Manhattan. Thank you, and good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this is an application by the East River 50s Alliance with co-applicants Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, New York City Council Members Ben Kalos and Dan Gorodnik, and New York State Senator Liz Kruger. The applicants are seeking approval of a text amendment to create contextual zoning regulations and to establish a variant of the voluntary inclusionary housing designated or inclusion, inclusionary housing program in the East River 50s and Sutton Place neighborhood in, Manca in Manhattan Community District 6. Now, the East River 50s Alliance is a nonprofit organization founded in 2015 by East River 50s residents, co ops, and condominiums. The organization was established in response to a proposed tower development in the neighborhood. Uh, the primary objective of the organization is to adopt the proposal to be discussed today. The Sutton Place neighborhood is located in the northeastern corner of Manhattan's Community District 6. The proposed project area is shown here in the cyan. Um, right here. Gets a little lost in, in the busyness of the land use map. Um, it's bordered here by the Ed Koch Queensboro Bridge and Lenox Hill neighborhoods to the north. To the south, we have Turtle Bay and Beekman Place neighborhoods. Uh, the 50 East 
River 50's neighborhood is here to the west, and then FDR and the East River to the east. The surrounding neighborhoods are characterized by medium and high density residential and mixed use developments, with building heights reflecting the same variety and range as is seen in the project area. The project area follows the R10 uh, zoning district, generally here along the East River, and then also here to the south um, between East 51st and East 52nd Street. Um, then it deviates, so the R10 follows down over here. The proposed boundary deviates here and 100 feet west of First Avenue, um, whereas the R10 boundary is 100 feet, um, I'm sorry, 100 feet east of First Avenue, and the R10 boundary is 100 feet west of First Avenue. Um, and then up here at the northern boundary, um, it cuts across East 58th Street, a portion of this northern um, block, and then at 59th Street and comes back and then reconnects with the um, uh, R10 zoning district. Uh, the project area consists of all or portions of 10 tax lots that are mapped with the R10 zoning district. R10 zoning districts have, height, have no height limits and allow for a maximum residential and community facility FAR of 10. Uh, through the R10 Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program, the residential FAR can be bonus to 12. Uh, the proposed project area is predominantly residential in nature, with a few mixed residential and commercial buildings. The built character is generally mid and high-rise buildings on medium and large lots, the exception being a low-rise buildings on narrow lots um, here in uh, what's called Sutton Square, and then along the south side of East 58th Street, shown here in the mid-block. Um, now we'll take a look at the predominant street type to typologies in the project area. So the northernmost block, shown here, um, is located between Sutton Place, First Avenue, East 58th, and East 59th Streets. Um, only the eastern portion, shown here, is included within the project area. Um, and that's also this block right here. So the eastern portion, which is this building, is included in the project area, and then to the west is not in the project area. Um, developments in the mid-block here um, include uh, two residential towers with plazas uh, that achieve heights of approximately 370 feet and the tallest building in the neighborhood, which is 485 feet, uh, shown here. Uh, the south side of East 58th Street, which is included in the project area, also includes two residential towers shown here. Um, and those are 270 feet and 318 feet. Um, and then the mid-rise buildings ranging from 55 to 70 feet, um, a, portion, a portion of which is the development site that spurred this proposal. Um, and that is shown in here. Now, mid-rise residential buildings predominate along East 57th Street and Sutton Place. So here is East 57th and Sutton Place. Um, and then you can see the more consistent typologies on those streets. Um, redevelopment along wide streets, because this is in an R10, would be subject to tower on a base regulations, uh, which among other regulations has street wall requirements and requires between 55 and 60% of the building's total floor area to be below 150 feet. Now, the remaining east-west cross streets are a mix of mid-rise buildings, each um, with each street frontage having at least one high-rise tower in the mid-block. Now, this is an example here of how that um, looks on these streets that, that form the rest of the project area. Um, obviously, they're all a little varied as to where the, the location of the tower is and the other um, lower-rise buildings, but this just gives you an idea of um, that, how, that, how that works and a bit of the range that we're seeing in this neighborhood. Um, in this example, this is a 385-foot building that stretches into the mid-block, and then it um, has some lower-rise buildings um, that are adjacent to it. Uh, the remaining blocks further to the south uh, include an approximately 335-foot tall tower on East 54th Street, an approximately 363-foot tower and plaza with frontage on East 53rd and 54th Streets, and approximately 320-foot tower with frontage on East 53rd Street. Now, the proposed project area would maintain the maximum base residential and community facility FAR of 10, and would create contextual zoning regulations that would impose height limits of 210 feet for buildings fronting on narrow streets and 235 feet for buildings fronting on wide streets. Now, the map here shows the full R10 in black, um, and that R10 district um, 
and I'm sorry, the buildings within the R10 district exceed the 210 foot height limits. Um, and then shown here in the cyan again is the project area. Um, there would also be regulations that require facade articulation for sites wider than 80 feet. Now, the proposed project would also create a new voluntary inclusionary housing program that differs from the other programs within the city and that would replace the project area's existing R10 inclusionary housing program. Now, the existing R10 program would continue to exist in the remainder of the R10 district. So this portion here is in R10. It would continue to have the current R10 program. And then this portion here would have a new voluntary program. Um, and that proposed voluntary program uh, would permit a maximum bonus FAR of 13 in exchange for providing up to 1.6 FAR of affordable housing um, at or below 80% of AMI. And the bonus FAR could be achieved through an additional two FAR of residential use and one FAR of community facility use for an overall total of 13 FAR. This would be the only inclusionary housing program with a bonus for a community facility. Uh, the proposed text amendment would set a maximum community facility FAR of 10, a maximum residential FAR of 12, and a total of 13. So to achieve the 13 FAR, it would be necessary for a buildings program to include a combination of residential and community facility floor area. Uh, the maximum height limit imposed for projects with an inclusionary bonus would increase to 260 feet on both wide and narrow streets. And currently, the R10 district has 14 buildings taller than uh, the 260 foot height, proposed height limit. To facilitate the proposal, the applicant seeks approval of a text amendment that would modify resolution sections 23675, 2456, 3531, and 3565, and that would create the contextual zoning regulations, and then zoning resolution se sections 23154, 23932, 24161, and 3531, and that would establish the new uh, inclusionary or the voluntary inclusionary program and then also map that over this area. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I um, promised the commissioners that I don't plan to make a habit of making statements on every private application, but today there are two items, two complete applications before us that we believe are ready for certification, but where the department has serious reservations. To give some context, this proposal emerged from an effort to block, <clears throat> excuse me, to block a particular development in the neighborhood. Now, it's not at all novel for a rezoning discussion to be sparked by a controversial proposal, but there's an important distinction between rational and deliberate planning based on a sound land use rationale and policy making designed or shaped to stop a specific building proposal. The department has worked diligently with the applicant on the numerous challenges that are raised by the proposal, ranging from zoning and land use precedent to affordable housing policy to addressing concerns about height. Despite this work, the proposal before us today remains problematic and contains what I believe to be fundamental impediments to its approval. Specifically, the department believes that there are three core problems with the application. First, the proposal would impose bulk limitations that are not appropriate for the existing context. The department believes that the current R10 zoning district is appropriate in this area due to the neighborhood's current build form, as shown by Bob, due to its proximity to the city's largest commercial business districts, and due to the neighborhood's access to mass transit. The area's current built form is heavily influenced by many mid-block towers that exceed the proposed 260-foot height limit. Furthermore, the rezoning area is narrowly drawn, excluding numerous additional buildings that rise considerably higher than the 260 feet on nearby, nearby blocks. These include the Sovereign, a 485-foot uh, foot high residential tower that is located immediately across the street from a block where the proposed height limits would apply. Our second concern is that the proposal would effectively be a down zoning discouraging the production of even market rate housing, which in turn makes affordable housing creation less likely. The imposition of the proposed height limit would not only reduce the height permitted for new buildings, it would also reduce the amount of housing that could be built relative to today's zoning. This is shown in the applicant's own environmental review analysis. 
It's just not credible that this proposal would incentivize the construction of affordable housing. And our third and final concern, which is related, is that the proposal's variant on the current voluntary inclusionary housing program would actually discourage the construction of affordable housing within the area proposed to be rezoned. Because the a proposal would reduce the size of the floor area incentive that's available for each square foot of affordable housing provided, it serves as a disincentive. Just outside of the limited area proposed for rezoning, the existing R10 inclusionary housing program would continue to be in effect. So as a result, it would become comparatively more advantageous to create affordable housing and in fact even market rate housing outside of the proposed rezoning area but within the current R10. And so for this reason, the department believes that this proposal would not result in the creation of any affordable housing. We do have a purely practical concern about the proposal, which is that we believe that the city's existing voluntary inclusionary housing program has to be evaluated and applied in a consistent and rational manner to assure that both neighborhoods and property owners are treated consistently and equitably. We think that it would be counterproductive and also administratively untenable to codify bespoke brands of voluntary inclusionary housing programs to very limited geographic areas, especially when we believe that these bespoke programs would actually disincentivize the production of affordable housing. So with that, I'll now toss it over to the commissioners. Yes, Commissioner Deleuze. Sure. So three, three questions, and some of which I think would be helpful when this comes back. So to, um, to Chair Lago's point, I think it'd be helpful to have a side-by-side -side of the existing voluntary versus the like what this change would be. That way we could do that exact analysis in our heads. Um, the other piece is, have, are there examples uh, where the voluntary inclusionary has been used in this area that could be shared? It would be helpful if it has to share those. Um, and I, I guess... I've been on the commission now five years, and I believe this is the first time we've seen a proposal that was supported in this way by local elected officials, and I'm just wondering if that's the case and if there's any other precedent for that. Um, okay. So we can certainly do the side-by-side -side comparison. Um, I, well, I'll have to look at other voluntary programs. I know that further south, the... Projects in this site. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yep, I can take, definitely take a look at that. I am not aware of other um, projects with the co-applicants of, of multiple electeds, but certainly can look into that as well. Great, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Levin. I think there have been projects where the electeds have been co-applicants along with the community board, but in addition with the Department of City Planning. Right, right. Um, so that, would, that makes this one unique. On the other hand, you know, it's to be encouraged that communities get together and try to figure out what's best for their neighborhood. So this one was triggered by a proposal that certainly got everybody's attention, and it's, and it's worth thinking about. Um, there's also been discussion, I know, during the mandatory inclusionary housing discussion about reforming, revisiting the, the existing R10 inclusionary program because it really doesn't produce very much affordable housing. It's got a 4.5%, 4.6% housing requirement, which uh, now looks pretty wimpy compared to what we're working on in the rest of the city. Yep. Bob, I'd be curious to know, the briefing sheet indicates that the project area is one of the few um, R10 zones. Um, without contextual protections. It'd be helpful to know where else, um, I assume it's mostly in Manhattan, there are R10 areas that, but we should know where those are and, and whether they are facing similar pressures and <coughs> this would be a precedent there. We should think about all the places where this might apply mm -hmm. as we... Um, <coughs> Mm -hmm. respond to it mm -hmm. and um, 
I guess then following up on Commissioner Deleuze's request to understand the R10 um, side by side with um, this proposal, I'd also be interested to know about a soft side analysis and what um, development would look like if the existing R10 were used on those soft sites um, and then what this proposal would do. Um, but I realize that's a challenge, I realize mid-sentence that's a challenge because part of what's going on here also is um, assemblages and zoning lot mergers and people using unused development rights, the, assembling yeah, yeah. them in a way that you can't study. That's true, right. Um, the, in a sense, so the EAS does look at, does a soft side analysis, um, and so there are some assumptions made um, in that in terms of what is considered soft. But those are seeker standard assumptions, so um, we certainly can um, delve into that document right. in, and a, I imagine, in a further. Um, I assume the, the applicants are here. I imagine the applicants have their own way of looking at that soft site um, analysis, and perhaps that might be different from the Department of City Planning's, and it would be good to see both of those scenarios too. So just just to clarify, though, we didn't. The Department of City Planning did not do separate soft site analysis. The soft site analysis in the EAS is from the applicant. Mm -hmm. It's reviewed um, by our environmental planners, yeah. but well, we so are not. I guess to the extent you have different thoughts about right. how the soft sites work, it would be um, we would um, enjoy hearing about that. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. You also mentioned that um, this. Um, Rezoning would result in a uh, non-compliance. Um, the number of buildings within the study area would be non-compliant. What was it, 12 percent, or over 15 um, of the, of these buildings that are taller than the yeah. 260 cap? Um, I believe. <laughs> it's here somewhere. Right? <laughs> so if it's if we're starting at 210, then it's 25 percent, and then at two. 160, um, that changes to 16%. Um, oh, okay. So even higher. Um, yeah, you know, it would be uh, along the lines of, you know, additional information if, if that is um, really sets a new precedent for us, you know, the, to the extent that we try not to create noncompliant situations. Um, and we are, you know, this in fact would create a high degree of noncompliance um, as originally proposed, um, you know, to, to what degree are we, um, you know, is that a, are we setting a precedent? Let me, and let me step back one second. The, the percentages I gave you were for the entire R10, so let me give you the percentages for just the project area. Okay. The, um, for over 210 feet, the percentage, there are, uh, ten building, or there are nine buildings within the project area, so that's 10 percent. That's at 210 feet, and then above 260 feet, there are eight buildings, and that's nine percent. Okay. Okay. Yes, Commissioner. Arthur. I'm curious about the um, facade articulation question. Are there other uh, contextual zoning areas above, say, R8, where that is a requirement? Um, to have the facade articul articulation beyond. Um, 80 feet wide. Um, I'm not familiar, but I'd have to check with the zoning department. I believe that there are some other facade regulations within zoning, though I don't know exactly when they come into effect and it, if it's 80 feet or if it's at 100 feet. But that's something that I could definitely look into. And uh, the reason is uh, that I'm wondering is because being adjacent to um, our, one of our more dense commercial districts, um, the character of the architecture often isn't an articulated facade, and I'm just trying to understand what the rationale is behind that. Okay. Other question? Okay, well, this matter is going to be referred both to the community board and to the borough president for 60 days. Thank you, Bob. Let's now go to item number 14. Proposed authorization to reduce required accessory parking spaces located uh, within a garage. We're on page 306, West Village Houses and Perry Street Garage. And our presenter is Adam Johnson, who's our lead project planner. Page 306. Good evening, commissioners. This is a private application by West Village Housing, Housing Development Fund Corporation for an authorization pursuant to ZR section 13443. 
to eliminate the 168 required parking spaces that are accessory to the West Village houses located in Grunge Village Community District 2 of Manhattan. The West Village houses are a 42 building, 420 unit housing cooperative that are located on six blocks uh, on along Washington Street between uh, Bank Street and North Street. Uh, uh, sorry, Bank Street on the north and Martin Street on the south. The required accessory parking spaces are located off-site at a parking facility located at 738 Greenwich Street in a four-story, 240-space garage. As part of the findings pursuant to this section of the zoning resolution, the Commission must find that the reduction of parking spaces will not have undue adverse effects on residents, businesses, or community facilities in the surrounding area. Uh, as you can see from our land use map here, the project area is a little unusual in order to fit in all of the 42 buildings. Uh, <laughs> so there's obviously the Hudson River here. This is the Perry Street garage here. And these are the West Village houses along Washington Street. And I have an enlargement. It's a little bit easier to see on that one. So um, the West Village houses are in red with the light yellow along Washington Street. And then the Perry Street garage is is located right there. Uh, the area was originally zoned M15 and was rezoned to C17 in 1974 to facilitate the West Village House's development. In 2005, the area was rezoned to C16A with two of the 42 buildings remaining in the C17 district. The Perry Street Garage is also in a C16A. The C16A permits a four residential FAR and a two commercial FAR. The C16A permits an 80-foot maximum building height and a minimum and a maximum street wall height of 40 feet and 65 feet. This is a commercial district with local retail and a very residential character. While there are six historic districts in the surrounding area, none of the West Village houses are in the historic district, while the garage is in the Greenwich Village Historic District. So these are three photos of the West Village housing development along Washington by 11th Street. Uh, there are more photos in your briefing package, but we have a typical design example of, of the buildings. Uh, they're all very similar in, in structure. They're unadorned, plain brick constructions, five stories without setbacks and contained between eight and 12 units in each of the buildings. The 42 buildings were completed in 1975 under the New York State Mitchell Lama program that acquired properties through eminent domain and then provided to affordable housing developers. Under the parking regulations at that time, accessory parking was required for 40% of the dwelling units, resulting in the 168 residential accessory spaces. Currently, there are nine West Village housing residents who park at the Perry Street garage. Uh, the Housing Corporation estimates that 10% of the residents own cars and they park in other parking facilities in the neighborhood. There's 14 parking facilities within a quarter mile radius of the neighborhood. In 2002, the owners of the West Village houses sought to leave the Mitchell Lama program, which would significantly increase rents, the Tenants Association eventually reached an agreement a few years later with the city to convert the development into an affordable non-eviction co-op. So we have uh, project photos of the garage here. This is the corner of Christopher, I'm sorry, of Greenwich Street and Perry Street with four-story structure there. This is looking west towards the water, uh, and that's the garage site. The four-story Perry Street garage was constructed in 1930 as a public parking garage. The West Village Housing Corporation went to the BSA in 1972 and were granted variances for the required accessory residential parking spaces to be located over 1,000 feet from the zoning lot and for having over 150 parking spaces in a single group parking facility, both which were contrary to zoning regulations at that time. The garage subsidizes fees across all the West Village houses. And since the mid-1970s, the garage has operated as a residential accessory garage with 168 spaces, including 72 other spaces open to the public. We have a uh, site plan showing the location of the 42 buildings in the darker gray. Um, we felt it wasn't appropriate to require 42 site plans for 42 buildings, so this is what uh, <laughs> they submitted. Thanks. And here's a site plan of our garage. It's a basic site plan for illustrative purposes. Uh, six, there's 65, the building 65 feet in height and approximately 40,000 square feet, 76 feet of frontage on Greenwich with three curb cuts, 92 feet of frontage on Perry Street with one curb cut, and uh, West Village Houses leases the garage operations to a private operator. In 2013, the City Planning Commission approved the Manhattan Core Parking Text Amendment 
which permitted the reduction of pre-1982 required accessory parking spaces pursuant to section 13443. And the commission must find that the reduction of parking spaces will have no undue as adverse effects on residents, businesses, or community facilities in the area, and that the commission may prescribe appropriate conditions and safeguards to minimize adverse effects on the character of the surrounding area. I'm more, I'm more interested to understand what is an, an affordable non-eviction co-op. I've never heard that term before. Um, that's what it was termed at the time. I'm not uh, privy to the exact details of what that means, um, but I could look into that. And the, the purposes of the, of the action is just to remove the required I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Um, just, I'm curious, I couldn't find it. What's the utilization rate of the current garage? I understand that residents are not using it, but do we I know don't have it's... the utilization rate of the garage. I just have the figures for how many residents park there, but I can get that from the Yeah, applicant. I mean, is it filling in a need? It's hard to tell. I know it's not filling their need, but it's right. functioning as a public garage. Well, it's a residential accessory garage, so if they get this authorization, then they do not have, and they use it, then they don't have permission to have a garage there. So. Yeah, no, and that's what I'm getting at, you know, how, because it sounds like the residential accessory parking is being used right now for public parking, because what else is it going to be used for? The residents aren't using it, so. Um, so I'm curious about that, and I can't help but, but make the point, or, or, you know, acknowledge that they, I think it's interesting that they said roughly 10% of West Village House residents own cars you know and we saw st john not too long ago and the developer came up and made a point that you know he wanted a one-to-one -one, um ratio you know car per unit because that's what people want these days and sure and you know here we have a, a fact pattern that suggests otherwise just something to tuck sure. away <laughs> this is a mitchell llama development so all the uh units were affordable and uh any development that's being created a market rate development, the, the, you know, people who are moving in have a lot more money, and we know that people who have higher incomes have, tend to have higher rates of car ownership. Currently, it's about, in Manhattan, 23% of, uh, of residents have cars in Manhattan. Not, not 100%. Certainly not 100%. What I thought was interesting is that the, this fact of how few of the residents I think buttresses um, the MIH and the ability to remove parking Absolutely. requirements for affordable housing. Yes, Commissioner uh, Lovett. I have to confess to it being being an original tenant on in the, one of the Bank Street buildings here, and boy, I wish I'd stuck around. But, uh, <laughs> um, and I didn't have a car then. Um, does the West Village Houses own the garage? Um. And are they proposing to redevelop that site? Is that what's going on here? Yeah, they want to redevelop the site to whatever they can, because they're subsidizing the West Village houses. I right. mean, there's the ownership, there's other entities involved with the ownership of the West Village houses, and I think they're trying to develop the site. Nothing's been proposed yet, but they're looking into whatever uh, they can get for the site to help subsidize okay, the but th So there is a relationship between the ownership of the housing and the ownership of the garage. That's correct. Okay, and they're looking to perhaps continue to support the affordability of the co-op? Continue to support the maintenance fees for the co-op and help them set Through whatever value they can yeah. extract from the garage. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Rillo. So Stephen, and I apologize in advance for, for I think asking questions that will be somewhat repetitive to Commission Ortiz's, but I, I there's there's so much history here in terms right. of what the parking was created to do and how many and so just help me walk through this for a minute because we're talking about this as a reduction in parking, mm -hmm. but really what we're talking about is the elimination of parking. So I mean I, I see the distinction a little more clearly than just reduction in parking. Um, so at this moment in time. How many parking spots are there, and for what purpose are they there, regardless of how they're used, which we know is another issue? There are parking. 240 parking spaces at the garage. Okay. And 168 
spaces are specific to the residents residential except, right. of the West Village houses. And uh, as a garage in Manhattan, they're uh, able to utilize, they have a private operator who's utilizing the garage and the spaces that are not being used are then being used by the general population. Residents in the neighborhood, Correct. commercial so, businesses. Okay. So, and I guess when, when the question was posed about utilization, we didn't have the information, we didn't have the specific utilization. We know the numbers and... So how in this process do we, are the findings established? If the findings involve that the reduction in parking spaces, again, elimination, will not have an undue adverse effect on the residents, the businesses, or the community facilities in the area. How, how if we, what, at what point do we know that? And how do we determine that in, a, in this process, which is a non-Euler referral authorization? So the main focus, again, is of the West Village housing residents. So if they came to us and said, all the parking is taken up by West Village housing residents and they want to keep the parking and the parking is for them, then that would have an adverse effect on the residents of the building. But seeing how there's only nine residents uh, who park there, uh, then the effects on the residents of the West Village houses is, could be seen as being less adverse or minimal and they could then use any of the other 14 parking facilities in the neighborhood. We have, uh, the applicant gave us some information on the 14 other garages in the neighborhood, and we know of uh, 550 Washington uh, in the near future, I suppose, uh, coming online. So that's what city planning was focusing on when we were looking at the findings for the project. Okay, so, so even though 168 of the parking uh, spots are for accessory residential purposes because the other 70 may or may not also be used by the residents, that's the population we're going to determine the findings on? What about the 70 that are permissible to be used for public parking, whether or not they are? So we're looking so, so ha right, so I'll stick so, with that question first. So you they could look at the broader effects of people using the garage in the neighborhood. So community facilities, businesses, public parking, but the actual garage is for residential accessory parking, and that's what the uh, variance is for. So depending on who's using the garage is, is less relevant as compared to the residents of the buildings, the 42 buildings. So, so and where does it, uh, I, I, I'm not being, um, sure. I'm not trying to debate, I'm trying to get to the understanding this because the findings ask about the impact on everyone. Sure. And unless I missed the point about how the parking, <laughs> the legality of the parking spots and who they're supposed to be held for doesn't say all of them are for accessory residential use. Two, more than two-thirds of them are, for sure. How do we then decide we're only de deciding this based on the, the impact on the residents of the community? Sure. So when we did the 2013 Manhattan Court Text Amendment, that was after we did some research on who's using parking garages in Manhattan. And part of the... Uh, uh, more important bits of all very important information that we determined from that study was that uh, a lot of people are using residential accessory garages because in order to get a private operator of your garage, you have to go get a DCA license and then post rates mm -hmm. and then it virtually becomes a public parking garage. Mm -hmm. So uh, we feel like that's a good way, a good utilization of space. We feel like it's a more efficient use of space. If you have open parking spaces, then you can rent them out. Um, and that it also helps the residents in the area. 
So, and, I, uh, and I remember that, and I agree with that. So I think, I think the, the issue here, and I think that's why we have that in the, in the zoning text, is because we listed those other uses depending on who was using the garage. Mm -hmm. So if there was a hospital right next to the building and all the hospital uh, people were coming in and parking there, that could then be taken into consideration as an uh, uh, adverse effect on people who are using the garage. Okay. So I feel like that answer actually supports a little bit what I'm asking. So what I'm saying to you is how are we only going, based on even what you just said, how are we only going to focus on the impact on the residents when we, there is, perhaps, because I don't have the data, a utilization of this garage by the businesses, other people visiting the neighborhood, whatever the other category, businesses, residents, community, and community facilities. Right. That's, I'm just, I'm. Sure. Well, you know, we can get a breakdown of the utilization rate and to see if they have any data on who's using the garage other than the West Village Houses residents mm -hmm. and see if they have any other information we can, we, we can uh, well, I, dig I guess, into. Well, I guess, yeah, that. that goes back to the question. How do we make that deter? What is the process or the evaluation or analysis that we do to be able to, to feel confident that the findings have been met or not. Sure. And that's the question. So do we go out and interview the businesses in that area, which there are, to say, well, what would happen? How do you feel about the garage? How do you know how many, what do we do? Is it just that we, we only ask the residents about their utilization, or do we ask the other categories that are listed in the findings to see what impact it may have on them? Sure. So we'll get information on who else is using the garage. Okay. And we already have information on the 14 other garages in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we have utilization rates of those garages. Um, and I think, like I said, what they were focusing on was the West Village housing residents who park there and how most of them don't park there. Right. No, no, I understand. Yes. Can, can, let me try this from a slightly different angle. See, I had assumed that the findings where it talks about adverse effects related to for instance, if 168 accessory spaces were being used by the residents and we then, in essence, remove those spaces, you'd have 168 cars now being put mm -hmm. into the local community, taking up spaces, and I thought that would be the adverse effect. And so in this case, what we're talking about is, in essence, nine cars being put into the local community for parking as opposed to a potential of 168, so therefore, the adverse effects are minimal at best, right. if existing at all. Well, that sure. would be true if it just asked for the adverse effects on the residents. No, except, except that if they were being put in the local community, it would impact everyone in the local com community. And since that you have 168 cars now competing for parking with businesses and other facilities in the community. That's how I Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I see what I you're saying. It. I think there's room for both of yeah, these interpretations. Yeah, yeah. Well, look okay. at page 325. You have the applicant statement of the findings, and it goes beyond just Okay. Commissioner Ortiz. And I, thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Cirillo, for um, digging in a little deeper there. I think that's the crux of the concern on the utilization. And I, I would quibble a little bit with the you know, the fact that the findings say adverse effects on residents. It doesn't say adverse effects on only West Village House residents. I mean, I, I understand we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, you know, their, their parking garage, but I think it's our responsibility to look at the words that were presented there in residents um, is a very general term. Um, so to the extent that we can understand um, how this might affect, I mean, we don't know if this parking garage is being well utilized by the community and if if by eliminating it we are going to dump you know 100 plus cars into the local environment we just don't know it's not here well it is in the application commissioner reading no, uh, yeah but they don't there's no data it's just it's just this <laughs> but by i mean but I, I could i could have said that i don't know I, by this action we're not removing the garage 
We're just yes, we are. We are. Yeah, it no longer needs to exist. If, well, they, uh, use, if they use the authorization, it would remove the garage. Uh, well, no, that's but the garage would still be there, and the accessory parking spaces are not are being removed, right? No, if they if they utilize the authorization, then the garage would the not be able to be used as a garage anymore. The I'm sorry. The worst case development scenario is a six-story market-rate residential building. No, no, but that that's not what this actually does. It may it's allow not, that. It allows it. It, it, re okay. it takes, if they utilize the authorization, then they can't have a garage there anymore. Right. At all. It At all. Convert to right. public or anything. Right. That's right. They would have to come back and get a new special permit for a public, be a parking public garage. garage. Okay. Right. Yeah, we, well, which is we're using used. the word reduction, but like that's right. why I said it was which really is, more of an elimination. Right. Got it. Okay. Although I do see, and Anna, thank you for pointing this out, that the applicant's analysis of the impact on business was not. If cars were not if right. able to park there, they had to, you know would there be an impact on business? It's about the people the potentially user. using the garage for the businesses in the neighborhood. Of course, they say there isn't. Yeah. Right. No. 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 It's just right. That's why I wasn't sure how we make the, deter the how we establish the findings or what data do we use to establish the findings. So. It would be helpful to see. And I know sure. this is being referred, so there will be more to come. We'll get, we'll get more data on who uses the garage and garages in the area okay. and the pricing on the garage spaces. So. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Are there other issues that commissioners would want considered? <laughs> okay, so this matter will be referred to the community board for 45 days, and it strikes me that when it comes back, we will have more data, and also I think it would be helpful to have some of the legal analysis of what is required for our findings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Helpful discussion. Uh, Stephen, I think you also have the next item. Uh, you're pinch heading for Sylvia. Uh, we're on item number 15, 462 Broadway. Uh, it's a Manhattan free hearing project, which involves proposed special permits to facilitate retail use, including retail use over 10,000 square feet. Item number 15, 462 Broadway, page 330. These are two applications by 462 BDWY Land LP, returning for pre-public hearing review after review by the Manhattan Borough President and the Community Board 2. Uh, Community Board 2 recommended denial with conditions, and the Borough President also recommended denial of the application. I'll provide a brief overview of the project. You may recall that the applicant is seeking two special permits. The first is to allow retail use on portions of the ground floor in the cellar, and the second is to allow large retail establishments over 10,000 square feet. The building itself is six stories. It's located at 462 Broadway within an M15B zoning district in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. Uh, the image here is of the building uh, on the street corner um, where the large retail establishment is proposed around the red, encircling the area where the red is where the large retail is proposed. The building consists of two portions, which I'll refer to as a northern portion and a southern portion. And while the two portions could be accessed, accessed and operated separately, they have always functioned as a single building with only one C of O. As shown over on our area map here, um, the site is located along the Broadway Commercial Corridor at the corner of Broadway and Grand Street within the red dotted line in the very center of your area map in an M15B district. The surrounding area is mainly M15B and M15A. Uh, this permits light industrial and commercial uses as of right up to 5 FAR and community facility uses up to 6.5 FAR. Residential uses are not permitted as of right uh, in M15B districts. Retail uses are not permitted as of right below the level of the second floor. And in M1 districts, certain retail establishments over 10,000 square feet are not permitted as of right. And over the years, this area has uh, evolved from primarily manufacturing into a mixed use District. We have our area photos here, our site photos of the streetscape along Broadway. This is the corner right here on Broadway and Grand. Uh, the sidewalk here along Grand is 16 feet wide and it's 18 feet wide along Broadway. So it's very wide sidewalks. Broadway and Grand are both truck routes. Um, until recently, the majority of the building, including the southern portion of the ground floor and most of the upper floors, were occupied by the International Culinary Center as a use group nine trade school use in conformance with the zoning use regulations. In 2015, the ICC eliminated its ground floor operations, consolidated its trade school and accessory office space, and vacated the southern portions of the ground floor 
versus the third, uh, through the third floor spaces, and now it's vacant. The no northern portion, which is right next to the area right here on, on the northern area of the site, uh, historically has housed non-conforming retail uses, uh, but has been vacant since May 2016. The applicant intends to pursue a separate land use application in the future to allow retail use in the northerly portion of the ground floor. We have images here along Crosby Street. Uh, Crosby Street is a narrow street. It's 50 feet wide, and the sidewalks, I think, are 12 feet wide. It's very narrow. The, uh, the loading and unloading is in the back with the service elevators are in the back of the building. We have a zoning lot site plan here. Uh, the project site contains approximately 20,000 square feet and has about 100 feet of frontage on Broadway and Crosby Street and 200 feet of frontage on Grand Street. The northern end and southern portion of the building could be accessed separately through the various entrances. The existing building contains approximately 117,000 square feet of floor area and an FAR of 5.8. So the proposed development here, uh, the applicant proposes to use the cellar of both uh, the northerly and the southerly portion of the building, and the southerly ground floor, the southern, southern second floor, and the southerly third floor for commercial retail uses, and house a single large retail establishment of 28,634 square feet of zoning floor area. Um, <coughs> the area shaded in blue is the use waiver associated with the special permit pursuant to the use group six retail, and the red dotted area is the waiver associated with the uh, large retail special permit. It's a little bit hard to tell, but the red dots also extend on top of the blue of that diagram. We just have a uh, more cellar plan. Uh, first floor, second floor, and then the third floor plan. So the actions, uh, section 74799 allows the commission to modify the use regulations of the M1 district to permit retail establishments over 10,000 square feet, provided that the following, um, sorry, following findings are met through by the City Planning Commission. So you can read through those that have been in your packet. And also, the other special permit, Section 74781, allows the Commission to modify the use regulations in the M15B district to allow retail use below the level of the second floor. Uh, documentation of the applicant's good faith marketing efforts is provided in the applicant's statements of findings in your package. Uh, the applicant marketed the space at $90 per square foot through February of this year. I believe it was $75 uh, on the below grade levels. So on to the uh, review. The application was recertified and referred out on March 6, 2017. At its full board meeting on April 20th, Community Board 2 adopted a resolution recommending denial of the large special permit for large retail and denial of the good faith marketing special permit unless the following conditions are met. The total floor area for any single retail store, including the seller, does not exceed 10,000 square feet and that there'll be no eating and drinking establishments and late night uses. The Manhattan Borough President sent a letter dated May 22nd recommending denial of the application and noted that the proposed retail use is not within the character of the neighborhood and they continued, they continued to question the marketing efforts of the applicant and efforts to lease to a conforming use for the vacant space and they had concerns about the long-term viability of retail in the area and loading and unloading on Crosby Street. <coughs> if you happen to take any questions that you have. Questions from commissioners. Commissioner, please. Just quickly on this size of the retail establishments not being within the character of the neighborhood, aren't there a number of other uh, large retail spaces? Yes, in there this are. Area? Yeah, there's a number of large retail spaces. A couple have gotten, uh, I think there's been four special permits granted in the Soho Noho area. In the last few years, uh, one of them was withdrawn from city council, but the other three, one's being, uh, being developed right now, but there are a number of large retail areas, and obviously Broadway's a major commercial corridor for the city. Yeah, that's what I'm, okay, thank you. I would uh, also note that there are a number of large retail spaces that are operating without the special permit, and I believe it was last week the Department of Building Buildings issued a number of violations against them for operating without the special permit. Commissioner Efron. I assume the owner or the representative of the owner will be here tomorrow to talk about uh, the community board's uh, recommendations, including the no eating and drinking establishment. Sure. They're going to be here. Uh, I spoke with them, and I know they've spoken to the community board a number of times about the project, and 
they can answer all your questions then. There was, I just wanted to mention, there was an eating and drinking establishment at the ICC on the ground floor mm -hmm. back when that was there. <coughs> I, <remember. laughs> I think many of us have fond memories of meals eaten there. <laughs> Other questions from commissioners? Okay, so this matter will return on Wednesday. We had our public hearing. Let's now go to item number 16, page 402, proposed zoning text amendment concerning Hudson Yards open space. This is the Manhattan West Phase 3 project, and Commissioner Cirillo is recused. Our presenter is Annie White. Uh, we're on item number 16, page 402. Okay, um, good afternoon, commissioners. This is an application for a text amendment to provisions of the Special Hudson Yards District, located in Community District 4 of the Borough of Manhattan. The applicant for this project is Brookfield Office Properties. The site, located at 371 9th Avenue, is within subarea B2 of the Farley Corridor, the Special Hudson Yards District. The text amendment proposes to modify provisions of the public access areas of the 9th Avenue rail yard to facilitate the design and construction of the Central Plaza and Dyer <coughs> Avenue platform. The project site, known as Manhattan West, um, which is outlined here in red, is generally bound by 9th Avenue to the east, the Dyer Avenue platform to the west, West 31st Street to the south, and West 33rd Street to the north. So um, for some background, the site was rezoned in 2005 from M16 to C64 as part of the Hudson Yards rezoning with the purpose of facilitating the development of a transit-oriented, medium to high-density, mixed-use urban center with a ro robust open space network. The C64 district has a total as of right FAR for commercial development of 12 with two FAR for community facility uses. This can be increased to a maximum of 19 FAR through the Hudson Yards District Improvement Fund bonus. Within subarea B2, residential uses up to four FAR are only permitted after the 15 FAR of commercial uses have been developed unless the chair of the City Planning Commission grants a certification to allow residential use to be introduced prior to the completion of the minimum required commercial FAR. Here's a land use map of the surrounding areas. Um, sub areas B1 and B2 are outlined in the blue dash line. The area surrounding the site contains a mix of commercial, residential, public facility, transportation, and utility uses. Across 10th Avenue from B1 is the eastern rail yard of, the, of Hudson Yards. And there are also several major institutional and public facility uses in the surrounding area, including the U.S. Postal Service mail facility to the south across West 30th Street and the James A. Farley Post Office building um, to, the, to the east across 9th Avenue. You can see them both here in the, in the large blue swaths. To further orient us, here are some site photos. Um, these are mostly looking from the north to the south along 9th Avenue. You can see the site, which is still largely under construction on the top and to the right. And some, uh, again, this is looking from the south to the north. Um, and you can see the, the post office building on the right and, and, and Manhattan West um, on the left. The Special Hudson Yards District included regulations for public access areas. In 2014, the applicant applied for a text amendment to modify these public access area requirements for the 9th Avenue Rail Yard. The result of this application is reflected in the map here on the left. The map on the right shows the current proposal of the public access area plan. The blue highlights the minor modifications, primarily extending the central plaza an additional 20 feet to the south. The portion outlined here in red are the public access areas being addressed in this application for phase three, that, which includes the Central Plaza and the Dyer Avenue platform. And this is the illustrative plan that highlights how these public access areas um, have actually been designed to fit out along the site. So in addition to the delineation of the public access areas that came um, through the rezoning, the 2014 text amendment created a phase development plan for the 9th Avenue public access areas. This outlines the four phases of the Manhattan West plan and identifies the minimum public access areas that must be provided in connection with various buildings developed along the site. The current application is for phase three of Manhattan West, which includes the Northwest Building, the Northwest Retail Podium, the Southwest Retail Podium, along with the western half of the Central Plaza and Dyer Avenue platform. So there are more extensive details on the proposed modifications with the text amendment in the briefing package, but I'll quickly run through um, the proposed changes. 
So the first is to modify entry, entry signage location requirements. Given the extensive street frontage of these areas, the existing zoning would result in an overabundance of signage, creating numerous obstructions within the pedestrian realm. With the proposed modifications, entry signage would be provided at specific and strategic primary access points to the 9th Avenue rail yard, resulting in five entry signs. Secondly, to permit protective bollards within the public access areas, which are required due to the active train yard underneath the platform. As a result of subsurface conditions, it is not possible to locate all of the bollards outside the public access areas. To allow a portion of the plaza to be located beneath a cantilever, because of the dimensional requirements of the um, public access areas and circulation paths, the southeast tower cantilever is approximately 10 feet over the widened portion of the central plaza. The proposed text would allow for this cantilever no greater than 10 feet at this specific location. To expand the boundary of the central plaza and modify text relating to dimensions and locations, the applicant believes the wider width of the central plaza will provide a more spacious and inviting open area while maintaining the 12-foot circulation paths within 20 feet of the facades. Minor relocations of provisions within the text and then to, specify, to further specify the types of events permitted within the event space, and I'll get into a, a bit more detail about this. Um, under the current text, the event space, which is defined as a 4,500 square foot designated area, can be used for programming throughout the year. When an event is not being held within the event space, tables, chairs, and movable food kiosk will be provided, which is seen in the non-event plan at the top left up here. Um, general public events, which are open and accessible to the general public, free of admission, such as concerts, performances, festivals, would be able to be held at all times of the year, and that an example of that plan is on the bottom left. So this text amendment would authorize summer events to occur up to 75 days between April 1st and November 15th for free performances, permitting temporary stages, structures, and seating to extend up to 2,000 square feet beyond the event space, and that plan is on the slide on the bottom right. And then in the winter, the space may contain an ice skating rink from November 15th to April 1st, which would be open to the general public, but a fee may be charged, provided that the total admission and equipment rental fees does not exceed the highest combined fees charged at a skating rink operating in a public park. The applicant believes these events will draw users and spectators to the Central Plaza to enliven the 9th Avenue rail yard that could otherwise remain unpopulated during the colder seasons. And you can see the plan for where that ice skating rink would go in the top right. At its executive committee meeting on May 22nd, Manhattan Community Board 4 voted in favor of the resolution recommending approval of the application. Additionally, on May 30th, the Manhattan Borough President issued a recommendation to approve <coughs> the application. And um, this is an illustr illustrative plan with some rendered call-outs to further describe the distinct <laughs> areas and, and character of the 9th Avenue Rail Yard public access areas. And I'm um, happy to answer any questions. I'll just note that when the presentation was made to the community board, it got a standing ovation. Oh. Yeah. Yes, I've never seen a, a, a <laughs> Hudson Yards developer get a standing ovation at a community board meeting, but it happened. Questions from commissioners? Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to the public hearing on Wednesday. Sorry. Let's now go to item number 17, page 453. Also, I'm in having for hearing action, uh, actions involving zoning map and zoning text amendment, city map amendment, disposition of city owned property to facilitate mixed use development, including affordable housing, and a commemoration uh, for the Harlem African burial ground. Welcome back, uh, Edwin Marshall. We're on item number 17, page 453. Yes, I'm sort of bookending today, yes. as a matter of fact. Um, thank you and good afternoon again. Uh, the applicant, the Economic Development Corporation, is seeking several discretionary approvals to redevelop the former East 125th Street, uh, 126th Street bus depot into a mixed use development which would have affordable housing. Uh, retail as well as space to commemorate uh, the African burial ground. Uh, the site is located in East Harlem within Manhattan Community District 11. Uh, the project location uh, is the bus depot, uh, it, which is bounded by 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 126th Street and 127th Street. The bus depot occupies a full city block. Uh, it comprises about 105,000 square feet. In addition, there's a bus parking area, which is just outside to the west on 2nd Avenue, which has about 9,700 square feet. 
So the entire development area will have about 115,000 square feet. I wanted to uh, address the commissioner's attention to this trapezoidal area. This is the African burial ground, and this is the area that will be preserved and commemorated as uh, a burial memorial. Uh, this image shows uh, it drills down on the footprint of the garage block, and you can see the African burial ground, uh, which is located right here. It has about 18,000 square feet of lot area. These are images that show the existing built condition. Uh, this is the bus garage right here. This is 126th Street. This is a Triborough Bridge, 125th Street right here. And these are images that show the existing garage. It's a two-story structure, uh, which was occupied until the year 2015 when the MTA vacated it. Uh, the buses have been relocated to a garage, a new garage on Lenox Avenue, uh, Malcolm X Boulevard, and 146th Street. Another image showing the existing built condition. Again, uh, this is the bus depot, the Triborough Bridge, Tano Towers located here, uh, the Grant House is located right here, or Rauga Houses rather. Uh, and this over here is the uh, sanitation uh, facility that the Commission has uh, looked at over the past few weeks, located right here on 127th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. Site is zone M12, which allows light manufacturing uses. Um, residential uses are not permitted as of right in M12 districts. Community engagement was a very important part of this project. What you see before you are the partners that comprise the community engagement uh, a process, the speaker, the borough president, Community Board 11, and the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force have been driving uh, this proposal, trying to get interest in getting for both the site redeveloped as well as commemorating the African Burial Ground. And briefly, uh, this is a colonial era, era uh, burial ground. It dates back to the uh, 1640s. Uh, it is the oldest known uh, burial ground in Harlem and probably one of the oldest known in the entire city. Uh, roughly from uh, through the 1800s into the early 1900s, uh, the ground has been redeveloped for a number of uses. One of the most notably is a movie studio, which you see in the middle image. Uh, in the 1940s, it was redeveloped into a trolley bar <coughs> and then was repurposed as a bus depot, which was vacated in the year 2015. This is a shows uh, a commemoration ceremony uh, by the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force. And what you see here are the remains, some of the remains that are in the boxes here. And this uh, ceremony basically says prayers and kinds words over the remains. Uh, but again, uh, the African Burial Ground Task Force, their focus is to ensure that whatever happens on the site, that there is a homage and there's respect paid to those that are uh, buried there. The archaeological process was fairly extensive. It dates back to uh, 2015 or so, uh, when the Harlem River bridges actually were under uh, reconstruction, actually prior to 2015, uh, DOT engineers found that there were some remains there, and there's a possibility that more remains may be found on the site. What you see before you are images of, of trenches that were dug as part of a phase one archaeological study. And what they found was they did not find any intact bodies. Uh, what they found was disarticulated remains. And it's believed that as the, uh, as the area became more developed through the 1800s and into the early 1900s, it basically the remains were disturbed. And what you have are these disarticulated remains that are in the, in the trenches right now. So there was a vision that was developed. Uh, one, this was started in 2009. So this is a process that's been going on for about eight years or so. There's been significant community involvement and engagement with this. Uh, through 2011 to 2014, there have been a number of charrettes and community sorts of uh, events to try to get people to participate and get an idea as to what people wanted to see on the bus garage site as well as to see how the, uh, uh, the burial ground would be commemorated. And as a result of that, in 2016, there was a community engagement award given to the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force in recognition of their community outreach efforts. So. The purpose, the, the overall goals, the desired outcomes are fairly straightforward. Uh, as I've said several times in my remarks, uh, to commemorate the African burial ground. Second is to develop a mix of uses, uh, including mixed income affordable housing. Uh, third is to obviously to enhance and to improve the streetscape. As we saw in an earlier image, there's a lot of, of industrial and, and transportation infrastructure, which is, uh, relates to the Tribal Bridge, and to fund a project that's financially affordable. 
So uh, this is, um, you know, sort of like the development framework. You can see that. Again, it's mixed use, 730 units of housing. Uh, some of it would be affordable. A uh, cultural center relating to the African burial ground and parking for 300 cars. Requested actions, uh, zoning map amendment from M12 to C63, uh, which allows uh, residential development up to ADFAR with MIH, enables the project to have the density and bulk to achieve its overall development objective. Second is a zoning text amendment to designate the site as an MIH uh, designated area to allow affordable housing to be provided here through MIH. Uh, a city map amendment, which would basically demap a portion of 2nd Avenue, which is located right here, used for bus parking, to demap that and uh, append that as part of the development site. And a disposition of city owned property for which DCAS is the applicant where the property would be disposed to a developer to be selected by. EDC. EIS, the Generic Draft Environmental Impact Statement, was uh, prepared for this, and the Commission can see some of the impacts uh, that were uh, found with that. And this is an illustrative plan. This shows you uh, what's happening. This is a site plan. You can see the memorial, uh, 18,000 square feet, open to the sky, uh, a museum uh, dedicated to uh, the memorial, and also there's another about 15,000 square feet of, of space that would be dedicated for some other type of, of community facility use as well. And you can see the retail and the residential on the site plan. And this is an illustrative massing giving the commission an idea of what could happen. In terms of the public review, uh, these applications were certified on February 21st of this year. Manhattan Community Board 11, by a vote of 26 in favor, one opposed and two abstaining, adopted uh, a recommendation with conditions uh, the conditions basically, again, focused on the commemoration of the African burial ground. Uh, they focused on affordability, that that should be maintained and, and expanded and enhanced. Uh, it focused on uh, a developer that's willing to work with the community. And also, it, it focused on the RFP process, that the community be given an opportunity to engage with the city to help formulate a, a, a final bill program of the development site. On Friday, late Friday, we received um, a recommendation from the borough president to also approve this project with conditions, and the conditions basically echo uh, what the community board had mentioned in their resolution. Uh, that completes my presentation. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Efron. Thank you. Um, I seem to recall from the East Harlem certification, rezoning certification, that there is an FAA maximum height, um, does this property fall under that since the massing will be subject to a lot of open space? Yes. So it's 35 feet, 35 stories? Yeah, it's about 35, 33, 30, uh, 330 feet, somewhere thereabouts. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. Other questions? Okay, then this item will be at the public hearing on Wednesday. So let's now go to the future votes. Uh, on Wednesday, June 7th, staff have prepared favorable resolutions for the following. The Whitlock and 165th Street rezoning in the Bronx, the War Manhattan Plaza text amendment to modify the plaza regulations on specific streets in the Special Rural Manhattan District. We have the Greater East Midtown rezoning. Uh, you've had several uh, post-hearing uh, follow-ups on this, and we are here to answer any additional uh, concerns you may have. But we prepared uh, favorable resolutions, and certainly for the tax amendment, I know Commissioner Cerullo, you're recused. Just in case anybody says it. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Sorry. Fred, 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 Fred. <laughs> Commissioner Levin wants to discuss oh, yes, it, so sorry, we have to boot you. No, 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 I think, no, 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 my, my question is on the other side of the district, Fred. I think it's safe. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to note that we did get a letter in our package from Deirdre Carson about that hotel site at, what is it, 48th and 5th, and she has some additional information that maybe didn't quite get to us. I realize we're poised to vote on this application on Wednesday. It's probably too late to deal with these issues, but I do hope the city council may take an opportunity to dig into it if that becomes appropriate. I think yeah, that's true. A, a, a late rising story that mm -hmm. is the kind that we um, sometimes give some, you know, are, are able to adjust right. to if, if it, you know, if we really are in a situation where a development is underway but not quite sure. vested. 
Sure. I'd be sympathetic to doing something like that, but okay. obviously don't want to derail our vote. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, you're right. Perhaps there is an opportunity for City Council. We believe that there is an appropriate venue with the BSA um, to um, for, for this hotelier uh, development to uh, do a delayed vesting. Um, so we, we did not we did not incorporate a different kind of vesting in our text amendment. I just didn't want her to think that yep. that plea we went on. No, it, yes, yes. And we've, we've, we've uh, communicated with, okay. um, with Yertra. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Other, yeah. Good. Okay. We're looking to come back. Comes back. <laughs> we have the Broad Channel Resiliency Rezoning as well as the uh, Hamilton Beach Resiliency Rezoning. Mm -hmm. 25 Stanley Avenue, which involves a special hillside preservation district certification for a zoning lot subdivision. 225 and 228 Getz Avenue, which is also a proposed special South Richmond Development District zoning lot subdivision. We have 528 Auburn Avenue, which is a special South Richmond Development District zoning subdivision, zoning lot subdivision. And 35 Charter Oak Road, which is a special natural area district certification that no authorization is required to facilitate changes to an existing residential uh, building. Uh, moving on to June 21st, I know it's been a long day. Uh, but we have the East 34th Street Golf Club. Uh, had some uh, a very productive, I think, public hearing, and so everybody's shaking their head, nodding their head. Yes, 62 Green Street, which is a proposed special permit to facilitate retail space. We also have the Department of Sanitation uh, District 11 garage. <laughs> Recall we had that on public hearing a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. There were some concerns raised. We have a letter uh, from the commissioner, which. Uh, Mr. Marshall, you may come up again. <laughs> He's been up and down more than I have. <laughs> yeah, but he's not refused. Yes. <laughs> the two most fit no, people in the room. <laughs> I'm, I'm Edwin. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, we, we did le receive a letter from Commissioner Garcia from the Department of Sanitation. Uh, she uh, did respond to the issues that came up at the public hearing. Uh, there were basically maybe three or four. One was uh, what Commissioner had Marin raised about the odors and how frequently the, the trucks are washed. The trucks are washed, um, you know, on, on a rotation, on a cycle. Um, through study, it was determined that after the truck is washed, they really don't emit a, a lot of odors, according to the commissioner's letter. So the, the, the odors from the parked trucks are really, as a sanitation sees it, not, not an issue. If I may, I understand that the, that, that the trucks don't smell after they wash. The, the issue is that the truck washing takes place every two weeks. And the commissioner herself admitted that the, the, the existing facility creates a problem of odors for the adjacent hospital and residential. So if you don't address that problem and you move this thing up to 126th Street and you have this new development that you're talking about, they're going to be suffering the same issues that they're suffering down on 96th Street. So I understand that the response was provided. I don't find it adequate. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, this, this, the second issue was about um, it being an open facility and, and not being covered. Uh, one is a, is a matter of cost. Um, you know, this, this is a, a facility that's being leased from a private entity. Um, and the Department of Sanitation really doesn't feel that it's appropriate to invest a considerable amount of money to cover a site that they do not own. Um, they are, you know, willing to work with the community to try to uh, make this facility work and to, to make it as, uh, as good a neighbor as practicable. Um, all the trucks will be parked on the site. None of them will be parked on the street, um, as, as we understand and as also indicated in the letter. Um, and also, uh, for the uh, site to be covered, it requires additional costs in terms of mechanical ventilation, uh, where, where there's a, a cost tied to that. Um, in terms of a, of a larger a footprint, to maybe to have a, a larger building, um, sanitation did uh, approach the owner of Potamkin, and the owner was unwilling to provide additional um, space that sanitation could use to, to have a, a larger facility. So that's basically all. Any other comments? Just one other point I want to make is that in the letter, um, and it was in your briefing package, uh, sanitation did go through fairly in a fairly detailed way uh, the process they used for the fair share analysis 
and how each of the, the sites that they looked at, they looked at five sites, I believe, uh, didn't really work either because of size or the possibility of acquiring property from, from a private owner, um, you know, and things of that nature. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, I did want to note at the end, I thought it was interesting at the end of Commissioner Garcia's letter. First off, I think she gets great props for having s stayed through the entire hearing. It's pretty rare that we get a commissioner um, to listen. Um, too bad the proposal isn't one that's easier to embrace. But um, she does note at the end of her letter that... Um, she refers to this as an interim solution to the current pressing need. I think we all recognize the pressing need. Um, but she goes on to say, during this time, DSNY will continue to seek a permanent, more suitable site for M10 and M11 for the future. She, she didn't exactly say at the hearing. I think that's an evolution of um, thinking and um, I think a realistic one. And, mm -hmm one that ought to be reflected in our action. I'm honestly, I share Commissioner Marine's dismay with this thing, as, um, and I'm not really sure where I am on it, but it is more acceptable to think, if, if we can get sanitation to really recognize that this is a short-term emergency, get us out of 99th Street arrangement and not um, the best they can do by this community, um, it is uh, easier for me to swallow. Thank you. I'll, I'll also note that her comment is consistent with what we have heard from sanitation, that they're, they're, they are looking to site multi-district garages or facilities. Yes, Commissioner. Then they might get Spring Street, a fabulous thing with three <laughs> sanitation garages all stacked up in a beautiful building. Mm. Yes, it does speak to the planning process for Department of Sanitation that we're put between a rock and a hard place of an unacceptable solution that they're moving out of into an unacceptable solution they're moving into, um, particularly as the really hard work of the department is coming to fruition in the East Harlem rezoning process. So it's disappointing on that front. I, I would just want to know if, in fact, there's a, an option to renew in the lease. We can certainly find uh, out. Because it seems to me that plays in several different ways. One, whether it is an interim solution, and two, whether or not the cost is well spent. So on um, the ventilation in particular, which seems just to be a, a basic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Gallows. I mean, I, I would just say that I found both the Department of Sanitation's presentation to be compelling and the community's presentation to be compelling. I think that... Um, it's, it's very challenging when you're trying to solve a problem, um, but the solution that you're given is, is not the ideal. Mm. Um, but the problem still exists. <laughs> so we'll see how the 21st comes. We also um, can answer some of the uh, questions that were raised here at our review session on the 19th. Okay. Okay. Back to you, Jackie. Uh, the next item is the ECF East 96th Street uh, project, which involves mixed-use development, including new schools and affordable housing. So, uh, You're all going to be saved by the bell. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, so uh, Calvin will be walking us through uh, the post hearing follow-up. I also want to thank the commission for its indulgence in giving us this extra uh, two weeks. It allowed us to get from ECF quite a comprehensive 90-plus page follow-up. Um, and so now we're, as a staff, in a much, much better position to be able to answer many of the questions that were raised at the public hearing. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Um, in response to the questions and concerns raised during the public hearing for ECF 96th Street, um, the applicant team provided a detailed information uh, related to the school's utilization um, and need. Uh, SEA guideline and requirements and other considerations that resulted in the site plan that was presented um, as part of the uh, project. Um, so these are just some of the concerns we'll go over today. Um, in terms of just reminding us where we are, you know, East 96th Street and East 97th Street between 2nd and 1st Avenue, and this is sort of the current site plan where you have Co-op Tech, which is on the eastern portion of the block along 1st Avenue, and then you have the Marks Brothers uh, JLP, joint, jointly operated playground, which is on the western portion of the site. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
In response to, in a response letter, the applicant detailed the background concerning this project where initially the RFP was just for the reconstruction of Co-op Tech. Um, but after consultation with the speaker, um, the Department of Parks and Recreation, the site plan evolved to include two additional East Harlem schools um, where there was no allocated capital funding planned in for the improvements of those uh, schools' conditions, and as well as um, the Parks Department requesting that the Marx Brother Playground be redeveloped away from Second Avenue. So this resulted in the site plan that they had um, presented in their project. Co-op Tech is over 70 years old, and you know, as stated in the findings that were provided, to, I mean, the response that was provided to the commissioner, structurally it cannot meet the demand of the number of students who are seeking um, these certificate pro uh, programs for the vocational training that they have at the school. Currently, there are only one classroom dedicated to each of the trades that are taught at the school. Um, there's no common space where students can uh, and faculty can gather for presentations or workshops. And given the age of the building, um, the applicant has stated that there are a number of structural issues and needed repairs. Um, in terms of both Park East and Heritage High Schools, these schools are operating over um, capacity. Both schools have inadequate classrooms that are small and have been converted from other uses, such as locker rooms and you know, nurses' office. Um, both of these schools do not have the ability to grow and are in buildings that are uh, structural layouts that are not conducive for their current student body. Park East has 413 students operating in a building that has a capacity for 320, and Heritage has 10 classrooms for the 350 students that attend that school. According to the applicant, the proposed project allows for the expansion of these schools without using city capital funds, and the proposed project will allow for more students in East Harlem as well as citywide to access the programs that are available. Um, Park East and Heritage will share the four lower stories of the new building along First Avenue, and these will, this, that's where the more expanded um, spaces will be for the auditorium, the cafeteria, and the gymnasium. And then each of the schools will have two floors on the upper stories um, with 10 classrooms on each of those floors. Um, to minimize the potential impact to the surrounding community, the applicant has stated that there will be separate entrances for both of those schools, one on East 97th Street where they will enter through the park, and then one on East 96th Street. In terms of structural consideration, um, you know, given the concerns that were raised uh, by the commission and the public regarding the proposed height and whether the proposed project could be accommodated in two smaller building envelopes, the applicant team provided um, school construction mass and analysis. And according to the analysis developed by the applicant, a residential overbuild on the school on First Avenue would allow the building on First Avenue to come down I mean, sorry, the building on 2nd Avenue to come down approximately to about 40 stories. However, the two tower options would have implications for the joint building on 1st Avenue um, and result in a school that is not compliant with SCA's uh, requirements. The placement of the residential tower on the school on 1st Avenue would require separate elevators and stairways for each use and structural columns and mechanical, electrical, and plumbing infrastructure that will be in direct conflict with the, the school um, internal spaces underneath. Um, and as a part of their analysis, even if the plan was adjusted, so in part of their um, response, they provided these schemes where they were looking at ways that they can adjust that sort of conflict, but it would result in what they feel is a school that is less efficient and still wouldn't really meet um, SCA's uh, requirements. Um, so this is just what was provided, just showing the, t the overbuilt along uh, First Avenue, and the red are the portions within the school that would be in direct conflict with the residential um, overbuilt. And, and this, once again, is just showing the areas in the school that would be affected by the residential overbuild based on an analysis that they provided. In terms of um, the shadows, um, they were saying that with the 40-story tower on First Avenue, it would cast a greater shadow um, covering the Marx Brother playground as well as the adjacent Stanley Isaac playground, and in some periods of the year would cast a shadow as far as uh, East 
River Esplanade based on the two tower um, options. Um, in terms of the concerns raised about the processing for uh, the Marx Brother playground in the alienation process, they were saying that MTA sought alienation just out of due diligence to you know, make sure that they were acquiring a properly, the, the portion of the park properly for the purposes of their staging for the Second Avenue subway, and that the playground since its inception in 1947 has always been operated as such where the Department of Education uses the park in the daytime, and then the park is open for public use um, during non-school hours. And the, the other thing I'll note is that JOPs generate FAR. Yes, because it will be considered one zone a lot. Yes. So this was never mapped as um, parkland. You ready? If I may? Yes. So if it was never mapped as parkland, the MTA saw alienation legislation just to be extra cautious? Yes. Okay. We can blame the lawyers. <laughs> okay. That, that, that's what confuses things. Yep. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Efron. Uh, thank you, everyone, for really extensive homework on this. Um, definitely worth the two weeks. Um, I, I'm still trying to figure out um, uh, how to gain back more time at the playground for the kids um, if it's not being programmed by the high school for the community, which seemed to be a big issue in the community response. And also, quite frankly, how to lower the height of the tower, which really is hard to put in context, but it's understandable to achieve the goals of the three high schools. And those three high schools um, now Go are to the really site plan. It's really, yeah, I'll see the site plan. It's really clear um, that uh, the vertical penetrations uh, would be an additional expense. So my question is whether there's been any consideration toward a much simpler plan, um, which would be having the um, JOP playground, let's just call it Marx Brothers, doesn't have to be mm -hmm. JOP, um, on the First Avenue side so that the high school could stay in operation until the very end of the project, until the summer before the project. Um, and it could be built up as a higher park if, in fact, the, the flood zone is an issue there. It looks like it's the 2050 flood zone on the, on the mm -hmm. park's own map. Um, and if the high schools could fit on the 96th and 97th Street entrances and then have the build over um, of a greater uh, size floor plate for the residential tower, would that actually lower the height of the tower? And I'm just wondering if that's been considered, because it's not something I've seen written anywhere <coughs> under consideration. Um, it wasn't a part of sort of the alternatives that they um, provided. Um, the applicant is in the audience, so um, I guess we can find out other alternatives that they considered and you know what sort of constraints, if any, they provided to this proposal. Yeah, and, and I, I just say that I understood from the letter, which was really wonderful and very clear, that there was a new requirement to put the um, playground in the middle, but it's unclear um, if that serves the community purpose best, given that um, there's no chance for children to use that playground who are not yet in school, preschoolers, or for some reason not in school, if in fact it's occupied, if, if it's the entrance to the high school, whereas if it were on First Avenue, it could be accessible and it would have two corners, which would mean it would be lighter under any circumstances. We do have the possibility to discuss this again on the 19th, and so we'll see what we can learn about that. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Uh, you know, I, I am deeply troubled by the scale of the residential tower and the fact that we are asking a private developer to carry such a heavy load of public benefits. There, there's no doubt they're all very valuable benefits, but we're loading an awful lot um, onto one site. And if you look at it purely from a planning perspective, it makes no sense. I mean, none of us would approve that as good planning. I think we understand that it might be necessary politics to build it, but it's just not good planning. So I think Commissioner Efron, I, I wonder if she's on to anything. If we slide the JOP to far to the right, you could nestle the two high schools up next to the residential tower and maybe put some of the core that they're so concerned about into the residential tower, and then you could get an overbuild over 
the two new schools, get the, get the two new schools on their base um, without having to put stuff through the middle of it and put some residential above and maybe reduce the height of the um, residential tower. If, if, if it works, I would be surprised that it hasn't been looked at before. Yeah. But we really have to exhaust all possibilities because a building of this scale at that location is just wrong. And it's going to be as a result of a discretionary action. It's not going to be like 432 Park, which is as of right. This is going to be the building that de Blasio built. Again, we'll be glad to come back, although we will note that this is a relatively unique site and a full block site with very strong support from the speaker for the program on the site. I get it. Other? Yes, I just also want to note that the deadline for this project is uh, June 26. So um, we understand your concerns. However, um, I would suggest that we do get back to the commission on these issues. But uh, staff, in terms of your guidance uh, and concerns raised here by the body, uh, we'll be preparing a favorable. No, and certainly new issues came out today that didn't come up at the public hearing. If there are additional issues, I would please ask that they be raised as soon as possible because the 19th is our last chance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, again, engage with the commission before a vote on the 21st. Thank you. So uh, the next item is Baychester Square, which involves a series of land use actions to facilitate retail use and senior citizen housing. We also have a letter from the applicant, and Jutan will walk us through. Good afternoon. Um, so the applicant provided a public hearing follow-up letter, which we'll go over a few of the points. Um, so uh, there was community uh, participation, and uh, so they addressed the community participation and the, that the community board was in support of the application. They, they included uh, the affordable senior housing, uh, which was not in the original proposal or the RFP, uh, but was included based on community feedback. Um, discussing the input from the elected officials, specifically Councilman King. Um, they stated uh, three, four, six points, uh, some feasible, others not. Um, that, so King had a few suggestions. One, that it could be used as an office park, which would have higher paying jobs. The applicant stated that this, doesn't, uh, this would not be economically feasible in this location. The applicant is including a business resource center, uh, which would offer job training and a number of other things, which they, they go into the points. Um, another uh, suggestion was this charter school. Uh, this, uh, the applicant responded that this not-for-profit use isn't the best use for the development. Uh, charter school would not provide rents that are high enough to sustain the new development, uh, but a media lab would be integrated into the business resource center in order to um, uh, provide that for the community. Um, a health club was uh, suggested. Uh, the applicant will be providing a health and fitness center as part of the uh, application, which was part of the physical, cultural, and uh, health establishment. That was part of the application. A catering hall. Uh, the applicant is including a Taste of the Bronx, which will have many local food tenants and may provide uh, catered events. And then finally, uh, urgent care was suggested. Um, the applicants had discussions with health care providers in the area about possibly bringing something in. Um, additionally, uh, the applicant uh, questioned the 64,000 petition signatures, noting, again, strong support from the community board. Uh, and that no more than a dozen or so attendees uh, attended the public hearings. Um, they addressed statements made by the Bay Plaza attorney, uh, who questioned the lower vacancy rate numbers that were used in the area, and the challenges uh, to the applicant's EIS. Uh, the applicant responded by providing um, the analysis of the EIS, uh, the framework, and that it met the seeker technical guidelines. Uh, they also noted that the Bay Plaza shopping center is expanding its retail by 40,000 square feet as well. The applicant also agreed to a deed restriction that no outlet center would be located on the site to remove any competitive advantage an outlet center may have uh, created on their site. The applicant provided a list of design modifications they've made, which include uh, additional retail and entrances along Gun Hill Road, uh, park around the senior housing, includes inclusion of the business resource center, screening of the parking garage, and a number of other uh, design elements on their site. Uh, a few of the other broader points that were brought up were regarding traffic. Um, the impacts would be at seven intersections on peak uh, holiday weekends, 
and the applicant will do a traffic monitoring process to assess that once the development is completed or the project opens. The borough president, uh, you know, the, the borough president doesn't think that it would add significantly more traffic and is supportive of the project. Uh, parking on the site, there was question about uh, the distance from the parking to the retail. Um, they noted that there would never be, uh, it would never be more than 200 feet from parking to the retail. Um, the amount of parking, uh, again, all this is addressed, but 1,169 spaces, uh, the breakdown of the garage and the, the surface parking, 267 bike spaces, and then comparing that to the uh, other New York City projects and how it's very comparable. Um, and then the senior housing that McWestern would be the um, provider of the, the uh, retail building services, uh, and that their experience, including uh, them teaming up with Hebrew Home to offer additional services. Parking would initially be free for seniors. Uh, there would be 45 total spaces between 18 and 23 in the garage. There would be shuttles that would uh, be used both on and off uh, site. And then um, finally, retail and the uh, viability of the project was uh, discussed, and that's $1.7 billion in sales leakage and, um, in the area, and that Baychester Square Development would capture less than 20% of that sales leakage. Um, that this project differs from the kind of Bay Plaza traditional shopping mall, this type of um, center, but that um, the neighboring retail across Gun Hill Road is supportive and feel it would strengthen the area rather than create too much competition. Um, and then there is a full retail breakdown of what would be in their proposal. Comments from Commissioner? Yes, Commissioner Arslan. I just want to say this is one that definitely benefited from a visit um, oh. and that uh, it really does seem to respond to a lot of what um, uh, Larissa's comments have been about retail, that it seems perhaps that the investment there would make the entire area stronger. Um, and it was actually um, a, a very exciting site to visit. I know that's not a question, but I just wanted to get it out there. <laughs> a site visit is worth a million words. Yes, <laughs> yes Commissioner Delos. So, so two things. I, I didn't hear what you said. I, one, one thing that we heard in the um, hearing from the adjacent retail um, use was that that their signage restrictions that they basically wanted to have the same <coughs> signage restrictions that they had applied to the new site I think it'd be helpful to just kind of like see those side by side to have a better understanding of them uh, for the the Bay Plaza development yeah. and what they have versus yeah. The, okay yeah and then the only other thing I would say is you know I'm just I'm just struck by that it seems like there was perhaps I'm not sure of the full history here a missed opportunity uh, you know, a number of years ago, when 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 the city and the state were talking about the site and thinking about what are the potential future uses to have a broader community engagement process to think through that, it just seems like so much of the concern is really about what is the what is the highest and best use of public land um, to meet a range of community needs. And I think folks were putting forth a number of reasonable alternatives that, had they been considered early on, would have been viewed in a very different light. Um, I think it's tough after an RFP has been issued and people put money into developing projects. Um, it, you know, it, it's very hard at that point. But I think a number of the recommendations were very reasonable. I think the issue, Michelle, is the proprietary nature of, uh, of city and state agencies. I mean, you know, the MTA and the these other entities won't uh, lose the, loosen their grip until there's an RFP, and then by that time, it's too late. It's too late. We, we all suffer. Other comments? Okay, then the session. Be quick, I promise.
Uh, so there was a public hearing uh, on May 24th that did not go by so quickly. Uh, it took almost three hours. But uh, during that hearing, there were 25 speakers in support of the downtown Far Rockaway development plan, five speakers in opposition, uh, three of which spoke specifically in opposition to the proposed disposition of the Department of Sanitation site. Uh, today is a post-hearing follow-up. There is a potential second post-hearing follow-up on June 19th. Uh, just to give the CPC an idea of the, the clock, uh, CPC's clock ends on uh, July 10th. Uh, so the CPC could potentially vote at the public hearing on June 21st or at a special review session, uh, special session at the beginning of re review session on July 10th. And DCP staff recommends that based on the number of item, follow-up items that will likely need to be covered at a second post-hearing follow-up and the need to complete a complicated environmental review, uh, that the commission hold its vote on July 10th. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are a number of post-hearing follow-up items for today, but also items that we'd like to cover at the next review session. Today, we'd like to discuss the request to extend the rezoning area, the breakdown of city investments in downtown Far Rockaway, some of the uh, zoning-related recommendations from both the borough president and the community board, the analysis that was done for schools and the DEIS, uh, EDC's peninsula-wide ferry study, some of the open space uh, mitigation obligation responsibilities, and uh, the ongoing coordination with the MTA and Long Island Railroad. Uh, now, the CPC heard testimony from two speakers who requested an extension of the rezoning, uh, an extension of a proposed R6 district. Uh, a portion of a de potential development site is proposed to be rezoned to R6 with a C24 commercial overlay. And a, another portion of the site is proposed to be rezoned uh, to maintain its existing R5 zoning, but uh, to have an update to the commercial overlay to C2-4. Now, the reason the R6 was concentrated where it was on this subject block was really to concentrate new development at a major gateway into downtown Far Rockaway. This uh, north-south street right here is Beach Channel Drive, and it's one of the few uh, north-south streets that connect uh, downtown Far Rockaway to the, the, to the Nassau Expressway. Uh, now, the development site has not been completely uh, assembled by the proposed development team. Uh, and I shall, should also note, uh, uh, at this point, uh, extending the rezoning area is not within uh, ULERP scope. Uh, but should the uh, project, uh, potential development site be assembled, uh, DCP staff did meet with the development team. And they would likely start with an initial phase within the proposed R6 uh, C24 portion of the site uh, to begin with. Uh, and once the complete site was acquired, uh, do a second phase uh, on the site that's uh, R5 with the C24 commercial overlay. Now this site, interestingly, is uh, slated to be a new grocery store, a uh, 10,000 square foot grocery store that's uh, slated to op uh, open up uh, independent of uh, a zoning action taking place on, on this site. It is expected that uh, future development of the site would incorporate the supermarket into that development. So the CPC did hear some testimony about access to fresh fruits and vegetables, this would be another resource available to the community. Uh, in terms of the breakdowns of the city investments in downtown Far Rockaway, there are really two separate investments. Uh, the first is a committed uh, $110 million, largely in infrastructure and service upgrades. Uh, these include uh, almost three qu quarters of which are street and sewer upgrades. Uh, and an additional $91 million uh, that will be used to implement the strategies that were outlined in the Roadmap for Action. Now, the city team expects that uh, this $91 million will largely be used to support the implementation of the Downtown Far Rockway Urban Renewal Plan. And while an itemized breakdown of what that $91 million is not available right now, uh, is expected to be used to uh, help support uh, negotiated acquisition as well as the infrastructure needed to support the development within the urban renewal area. Also note on this slide that part of the uh, $110 million commitment is $30 million for a new Far Rockaway library branch. Uh, there was a question from the commission about uh, potential mixed-use development opportunities at this site. The uh, Queens Public Library did look at mixed use development opportunities, but ultimately due to the availability of funding, uh, uh, selected the standalone library option as the one to proceed with. Uh, it is now fully funded and a project that they look forward to uh, moving forward with. Uh, staff would also note that the uh, Queens Public Library is and will continue to be situated in a relatively small portion of a larger site that is also occupied by a triple occupancy firehouse. So a potential mixed-use development would really constrain space needed for the new library, 
to provide access to uh, any residential uses above that library structure. <clears throat> um, some of this we covered uh, during the uh, pre-hearing discussion, but the community board and borough president had a number of zoning recommendations uh, that I wanted to quickly run uh, uh, through with you. Uh, the first was really to uh, uh, reduce the density uh, throughout the rezoning area. Uh, where R7-1 is proposed, uh, the community board and the borough president recommended that an R6 district be established and really limit the height of the tallest buildings to 10 stories. Uh, all, of our, all other buildings would really be capped at 85 feet. Uh, now, as a part of the city's proposed uh, A application, there were a number of modifications made to the original proposal that uh, reduced the location for where the tallest buildings in the rezoning area could be located. Uh, and additionally, new uh, maximum height limits were introduced within the uh, urban renewal area. The community board and the borough president also recommended that the proposed R6 district be reduced to R5. Importantly, within R5, there is no mandatory inclusionary housing program. Uh, and uh, uh, existing R5 zoning in downtown Far Rockaway has really curtailed the production of uh, mixed-use buildings. Uh, so those are two uh, major reasons why uh, a, a zoning change of that nature uh, uh, could not be made. Um, there was also an uh, interesting increase in the off street parking requirements. Uh, based on analysis of auto ownership rates and access to mass transit, uh, the, the city team feels confident that the proposed 25% requirement uh, helps achieve that balance and to support uh, new mixed income development. Uh, <clears throat> increasing the off-street parking requirement for low-income households uh, to the 75% would not be within scope, uh, first of all, uh, for, for low-income units. And for all other unit types, uh, an uh, increase to 75% would technically be in scope. Uh, but it would uh, uh, restrict uh, the, the balance of new mixed income development opportunities uh, by potentially skewing uh, new development towards more lower income housing. Uh, this is a graphic that was prepared uh, for the uh, pre-hearing uh, uh, discussion, again, illustrating the original applications, uh, maximum height limits and tower locations. Uh, and this is the uh, height limits that are now in the, the A application that really shows uh, uh, a blending of new building heights along the low density portions of downtown Far Rockaway uh, within this urban renewal uh, area uh, and stepping height up towards the center of this very large site. <clears throat> uh, there was also feedback about the uh, need for a school within downtown Far Rockaway. The uh, uh, draft environmental impact statement did show that there is sufficient capacity within uh, sub-district uh, 1, uh, District 27. Um, I'll note that the one school that is directly adjacent, the, the primary school, uh, PS253, uh, is overutilization, but there is sufficient capacity within the other primary and uh, intermediate schools in the broader Far Rockaway neighborhood. Uh, and of course, the project team is committed to continuing to work with the Department of uh, Education and the SEA to explore improvements to the educational offerings on the peninsula and in Far Rockaway in particular. Uh, there was a, uh, some discussion about transit access. Uh, ferry access is a uh, returned resource to the peninsula, a much celebrated returned resource to the peninsula. Uh, it now, it uh, started on May 1st, and ridership has definitely exceeded expectations. The ridership rates over the first month and a half have nearly doubled what was uh, the ridership uh, in the post-Sandy ferry uh, uh, that ran. Uh, close to 11,000 uh, weekly riders take this service. And one of the reasons why the service has become more popular on the peninsula, we believe, is because of a new free shuttle service that provides a uh, connection west uh, to Reese Park and east to Beach 50, uh, 50, uh, 35th Street uh, to the ferry terminal. Uh, and then on to, to Pier 11. Uh, now, Beach uh, 50, uh, 33rd, 35th Street sorry, is not in uh, Far Rockaway. It's in the adjacent Edgemere community. But EDC is looking to explore uh, expanded ferry service uh, peninsula-wide uh, and the supportive services that would be needed to support those locations. So potentially, connections further uh, east in, into Far Rockaway could be made. Um, so. This slide I wanted to end on for, for a couple reasons because uh, it shows uh, two things. One, uh, new open spaces that would be created uh, here on city-owned property by the Department of Transportation. This is plaza space that uh, it is expected that the Rockaway Development and Revitalization Corporation would maintain. 
and they really do have a vested interest in maintaining this space since they own and are in the process of rehabilitating what is called the Renaissance Center, which is right across the street from this space. Uh, while a maintenance plan has not yet been confirmed for the uh, urban renewal area, it is expected that uh, the developer would be responsible for the maintenance of the new private street network and the uh, publicly accessible open space that would be required on that site through zoning. Uh, so those are the post-hearing uh, follow-up items I have for you today. I'm happy to take some questions. Question from Commissioner Ardello. Yeah, Commissioner Ardello. Brendan, I think the, thank you for that. You definitely covered a lot in a little bit of time. I think the only thing, so I guess the other item that we'll talk about later is the specific um, Department of Sanitation site and the fact that the community board, the, the, the district manager who came, he was very specific about saying we don't support that proposal Instead, we think it should be an active playground. It would be helpful, I think, to hear more about that in relation and whether or not the folks that did come to talk about the garden, if there's, is there any other place to accommodate that? Because obviously they're quite passionate. Sure, and there's definitely uh, one thing I can speak to now is that there is a community farm in an adjacent community called Edgemere uh, that, that uh, uh, has been farmed and, and a great success. The city owns a lot of vacant uh, available land in that neighborhood, so there is potential, other potential for community farms in the vicinity of this area if that site is, not, uh, is, is directed for a different use. Yes, Commissioner. I know we'll be talking about this next week, but is it possible to get a copy of the retail market study? Uh, there's staff from EDC here in the, in the audience, and I will confirm uh, whether or not that's something we can get for you, but it's definitely something that we want to talk to in detail uh, at the next review session. Thank you. Sure. Other questions or comments? Then this item will also come back at our um, June 19th review session to cover the remaining topics and questions that have been raised now by Commissioner. And I think this time I'm not going to say so seven and we're done with the review session. Right.